Sim, o modo de dar, lá, ó, que uma coisa. Poderia conseguir a coisa de fato. Exactement. Alors, c'est un plaisir particulier pour moi. Ah, sorry. Sorry. It's a special pleasure for me to uh, welcome Alfred Gallico from NYU and Tampo. Uh, uh, he's going to talk about a version that uh, we didn't hear yet. Not as if you've got time having no problem, and of course, with application to economic, we very go down. Thank you. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, very glad to be virtually here. Uh, thank you, Leonard. Thank you, Jean Claude. Thank you all uh, for organizing this. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the, uh, the the same kind of uh, uh, equations that uh, have been discussed during this workshop, uh, but with a twist towards economic applications. So actually, my talk is going to be in two parts. I am going to first uh, motivate uh, this equation from an economic standpoint. Uh, and this is not uh, not new work. This is uh, this is work that has been done in the in the past 15 years. There's a landmark paper in that field by Cho and Sio. There is some work that I did with Bernard Salanier and also uh, with Arnaud Dupuis. Um, so all this basically is uh, uh, you know the, the precise set of description of the utilities that we sh we should endow the agents in order to have an equilibrium matching equilibrium. That, that is going to look like Schrodinger equations, like, Ber like a Berner Bernstein-Schrodinger system. That's going to be the first part. Uh, and then I'm going to impose uh, a realistic uh, uh, additions. Uh, and we're going to talk actually about a, a labor market where employee, employees match with employers. And we are going to add taxes. And we are going to see that we will be led to a system that will have similar features, but uh, not exactly. Okay, It's going to be a little bit more general. It's going to be non-additive, as the name of my uh, title says. Uh, and we will see some methods in order to solve for uh, basic questions uh, on that system, uh, namely existence equilibrium, an algorithm that will look very much that is actually a nonlinear generalization of the IPFP uh, synchronous algorithm. Okay, so so that's uh, that's that's what we're going to do, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about the set of methods uh, that are going to be used, and the set of methods, uh, you know, the Hilbert metric was uh, mentioned several times. Uh, uh, Guillaume showed uh, proof of convergence, uh, which uh, uh, you know uh, uh, is is different from the the Hilbert metric, but which is analytic, uh, which uh, basically is a contraction mapping argument. Uh, the the type of techniques I'm going to show, they have nothing to do with those. I mean, uh, they are not closely related to these. They are based on the theory of M function. Okay. And, and I'm going to introduce uh, you, you know, uh, for some of you, you might not have heard about uh, uh, these techniques. I'm going to uh, provide some reminders and some new results also on M functions. Okay. All this uh, we'll try to do in 15 minutes. Um, so, very quickly, because this is known to all, uh, I'm going to talk to you about the uh, Bernstein-Schrodinger problem, the basic one, in a discrete setting. Um, so uh, essentially, I have uh, two uh, marginal distributions, which I'm so on two sets, two, two separate sets. These are discrete sets. These are finite sets. Um, so you know, I'm going to assume that I have a distribution of workers. Uh, on a set of workers types, okay? So Nx is the number of workers of type X, okay? Or it's the mass of workers of type X. Think about an infinite population, uh, but where Nx is the frequency of encountering a worker of a given type. Uh, My is going to be uh, the, uh, the frequency of workers of type Y, okay? Uh, in its population. Uh, and then basically, we have seen this system all the time, uh, uh, and I'm going to 
uh, just display it so that you get uh, uh, used to my notations. Uh, so basically, this is an equation in ax and dy. And we're looking for ax and dy such that the sum of the y of exponential of phi xy plus ax plus by is equal to nx. Okay. And then same thing, when we're summing over x, we should get my. Okay. So we're looking for this trans joint transportation plan, uh, which has this shape and which has uh, fixed marginals and X and M1, okay? Uh, and so there were lots of talks uh, in this workshop uh, on uh, uh, an algorithm in order to solve uh, for the system, uh, you know, the very classical, you know, I learned from it in uh, uh, Ruschendorf's books. So I call it, uh, uh, in Ruschendorf's papers, so I call it the IPSP as Ruschendorf. Uh, but it's also called the matrix scaling algorithm or synchronous algorithm, lots of other names, RIS. It's a very you know, old and famous uh, algorithm that has been rediscovered many, many times. Uh, and there are lots of proofs of convergence as well. Uh, the most straightforward one, although it's maybe not that straightforward, is the, uh, Hel the Hilbert metric. Uh, uh, but, but, but again, you know, lots of techniques. Uh, and you know, I'm gonna talk a little bit about those economic applications. Uh, that follow from this show and show uh, landmark paper and uh, uh, that inspired my own work with Bernard Sadani and, uh, and also Arnaud Dupuy and others. Okay, obviously machine learning, this is very big due to uh, Couture's uh, uh, paper and Pierre and Couture's book. Uh, this is not, you know, very, very uh, uh, successful tool in, in, in machine learning. Let me talk to you about the economic micro foundation of this system. So we are going to have workers on one type, as I said earlier, and firms on the, on the other side, workers on one side and firms on the other side. Uh, and I'm going to assume that an individual worker, I, and so please interrupt me if there are any questions, uh, because obviously, you know, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, always a little, uh, uh, inhuman, this, um, this, uh, this, this, uh, this remote workshops. So do, don't hesitate to ask questions and interrupt me. I would be thrilled uh, uh, to, 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 to explain. So we're going to have an individual worker I, that worker is of type X. And uh, what, what is happening? This worker is considering a firm with whom to match, okay? So what are, what are the data of the problem? The data is that, you know, all things equal, uh, the all wages equal, uh, the worker has a given taste uh, for some types of firms rather than others. And this is captured in this alpha X, Y, okay? Some, more, some, some jobs are more tiring, okay? Some jobs are more relaxed, some give you social prestige, et cetera, et cetera. So this is all captured in this alpha term. But obviously, you know, on top of this, there is also the salary. And here I'm going to make a very important assumption. I'm going to assume that the utility of the worker, if this worker chooses job Y, is going to be the sum of the uh, taste of the job, which is expressed in, in dollar terms or in euro terms, uh, plus the salary, okay? And on top of that, not only am I going to have those two terms, but I'm also going to have a random parameter. Okay, so this random parameter is something that the worker draws. I'm a given worker of a given type. I'm going to draw a specific taste for a given job. Okay, this is basically what you cannot explain based on the observable. This is the idiosyncratic uh, heterogeneity that there is. Okay, so this is this additional epsilon term, which I'm uh, basically multiplying by a scaling factor sigma. And I'm going to make a distributional assumption on epsilon. Uh, and there are lots of assumptions that you can make, obviously. Uh, and we uh, discussed this with uh, uh, Bernard Sadanier. We, we, we basically investigate all possible distributions for epsilon. But if you take, and this, if you take uh, for epsilon a gumball distribution, uh, so if a, draw, uh, a worker I draws a gumball vector, you know, an extreme value type one random vector uh, with IID uh, components over each type of the jobs, uh, then you can show that uh, you are led to uh, um, a, a, a choice probability, probability of choosing Y, 
uh, because now the, the choice problem becomes a random choice problem because of this, due to this epsilon that is going to, to shift the maximum in the random way. So the probability that your utility is maximized at Y uh, is going to be equal to the exponential of alpha plus W, okay, scaled by a scaling constant. Okay, so this scaling constant is here, is basically minus UX, where UX is uh, whatever is needed to normalize uh, this, uh, this term so that it becomes a probability. Okay, so this is the logit framework. This is well known to uh, econometricians. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's well known that if you have a random utility shock, uh, which, is gum which has a gamble distribution, then you have a choice probability, which is essentially a Gibbs distribution, okay? So then I can relate my optimal transport plan mu. So mu is the probability that uh, uh, there's going to be a match between x and y. So mu xy divided by nx, this is the conditional probability, conditional on being a worker of type x, that I'm going to pick a y. This is equal to this exponential alpha xy plus wxy minus ux over sigma. Okay, sigma I'm going to get rid of. I'm going to, with that generate input, that sigma goes one. Uh, in a minute, but 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 here you see that there are a bit too many unknowns, right? Because you don't know mu, you don't know the optimal transportation plan, you don't know the wage w x y. It's adjusted at equilibrium, and also you don't know u x. But that's fine because you know essentially what we're going to do here we have we we reason on one side of the market. We looked at the choice uh, uh, problem of workers choosing firms, but the problem is completely symmetric, right? So if I were to assume, if I were to look at the choice problem of a firm, I would get basically something very similar. Uh, so if I take a firm J, uh, a firm J of type Y, this firm is looking for a worker. Uh, so it's looking for a worker's type that is going to maximize the utility of the firm or the profit of the firm, we prefer to say in, in economics. Uh, so the expression is exactly symmetric, apart from the fact that you know the taste of the firm for the worker is called the productivity of the worker. We call this gamma. And obviously the firm pays the wage. So there's a minus sign here instead of a plus sign. Okay, but here exactly in a fashion which is exactly similar as before, we're going to, to assume a gamble heterogeneity here on the firm's side, okay? And so we are going to get that the matching probabilities on the firm's side are going to be such that the conditional choice probability of a firm of type Y to pick a worker of type X, this is going to be equal to the exponential of gamma minus W uh, which is basically this part, the non-random part of the utility, normalized, okay, so minus W, where W uh, is this uh, basically uh, 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 soft max of the, of the utilities, okay? The beauty of this is that actually, you know, VY interprets as the expected value of VJ, okay? We're not going to need that. What do we want to do? Okay, so we have basically two set of equations. One that characterizes the worker side, it's here, it's here, and one that characterizes the firm side. What we're going to do is we're going to eliminate the wage out of this. How do we eliminate the wage? Where well, we're, we're going to multiply you know, those uh, uh, two by two, okay? And if we multiply these two by two, we're gonna get a relationship between mu x, y, alpha and gamma, alpha plus gamma, in fact, and minus u minus v. Okay, so minus, so there's a little bit of a, a, a renormalization to make here. Uh, I'm going to put, because there's the nx and the my, I'm going to put the nx and the my inside the, 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 the potentials. And I'm going to rename, instead of ux, I'm going to get ax. ax is going to be ux minus sigma log n. by is going to be by minus sigma log m. Uh, and I'm going to get a very simple relationship between mu x, y and uh, essentially uh, um, a and b. So mu x, y is equal to the exponential of alpha plus gamma, uh, which I'm going to call phi, whatever. This is the joint surplus. You know, if x and y match together, it's the utility of the worker, there's the taste of the worker plus the taste of the firm. So this is the joint surplus in economics minus those two terms, a, x and b, y. And those two terms, a, x and b, y, obviously, they are going to be adjusted by the fact that we need to fit the margins and X and MY. So this is exactly 
a Bernstein Schrodinger system. This is how we, uh, you know, this is where uh, Bernstein Schrodinger systems appear in economics. And they're everywhere in economics, okay? Because, you know, here I talked about a worker firm example, but I could have talked about uh, the economics of marriage. I could talk, I could have talked about the economics of intentional trade. I could talk, I could have talked about the economics of demand for cars. You know, those systems show up all the time, all the time, all the time, okay? So, um, so, so that's the simplest case, but you see here, from an economic uh, uh, standpoint, it's, it's a little frustrating, right? Because I really made baby assumptions on the way the utilities depend on the wage, okay? So here I assume that, uh, uh, you know, the uh, wage enters additively in the utility. And there are lots of reasons so that it shouldn't be the case. You see, the higher the wage, the higher the utility of the worker, the higher the wage, the smaller the profit of the firm. But there are phenomenons, real life phenomenons that are going to uh, make these relationships nonlinear. And the simplest one being the taxes, right? Uh, so when you have the tax in, in, in most countries, uh, the tax schedule is progressive, meaning that uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's a nonlinear relationship between what the firm pays and what the worker receives, okay? So if we were to account for this, uh, we need the, to know the tax schedule and we need to construct a function uh, that given a gross wage is going to associate a net wage, okay? So, so in general, this function is increasing. Uh, it might be concave, it might be piecewise uh, fine, whatever, you know, I'm not gonna care that much. I'm just gonna assume that it's increasing. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm going to revisit all the analysis that I did uh, because uh, uh, again, my, uh, uh, my interest is in economics modeling. And I want to get a system that 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 basically accounts uh, for taxes, and I want to be able to study what happens when I increase the tax rate. Am I going to get more unemployment? Am I going to get uh, matches that are going to be distorted and things like that? So I'm going to rewrite all the equations. I'm not going to show you the two pages. I'm just going to show you the changes where they apply. Uh, so here now the work, the problem of the worker is now that uh, the worker is maximizing the job amenity term, this alpha term, the taste, the, the intrinsic taste for the job, plus the net wage. And the net wage is a function of the gross wage, okay? But it's not a linear function, okay? Not necessarily a linear function, at least. Okay, but anyway, the, uh, the rest of the analysis is unmodified, right? I still have an epsilon term here. Uh, sorry, I don't know if I have normalized sigma to one at this stage or not, but if not, it's going to come soon. Uh, maybe there's a sigma here, whatever. Uh, I still have that, uh, uh, you know, new xy is going to be uh, essentially something which is exponential of alpha, exponential of alpha plus the net wage minus uh, this uh, uh, this uh, um, scaling constant, okay, divided by sigma if you want. And same thing on the on the side of the firm. So here I'm assuming that the firm does not pay any tax, uh, could have payroll tax, uh, uh, that wouldn't change uh, much uh, uh, ideologically. Uh, so I would, I, I would, I'm, I'm going to get on the side of the firm that mu x y is equal to exponential gamma minus w minus b over sigma. And you know I can uh, I can I can carry the analysis in order to substitute out w, okay. Uh, so essentially, I need to express W as a function of mu here. I need to express W as a function of mu here. And essentially, it's going to give me that mu is a function of AX and BY, okay, but not an increasing function. Okay, uh, sorry, an incre sorry, an increasing function of AX, an increasing function of BY, but not an additive function. Okay, there's, there's, there's no reason at all uh, that it should be an additive function. Uh, we can work. We could work this out. It's very simple. I would, you know, it, it would it would involve n minus one, the inverse function of, of, of n, and so on and so forth. But you see very well that there's no reason whatsoever that m should be an additive function, in the sense that it, there's no reason what, whatsoever that m x y should be a function of a x plus plus b y. But still, the a x's and the b y's they're here. Uh, they 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 are they they solve the system, uh, which is essentially that mu x y should have the right marginals. Uh, so the sum of a y of this is equal to n x, and the sum over x of this is equal to m y. So you know this this tastes like Bernstein Schrödinger, right? It has the same look and feel. Uh, it's just a little bit more general. Okay, if, if you take mxy to be a, a, an exponential of a term 
plus ax plus by, you're gonna you're gonna get back to, to, to your usual system of equation. Okay. Any questions so far? So let me describe what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna talk about existence and uniqueness, a little bit computation, uh, but I'll describe at the end of the talk, I'll, I'll say why uh, you know we're still missing uh, an efficient algorithm. Uh, rates are left for future work. Okay. And, and again, as I said in the beginning, none of the classical methods uh, that are usually uh, uh, deployed uh, to tackle uh, these problems are going to apply here. Okay. I don't think they apply. You know, I, I'd love to be pro proved wrong, but, but, uh, but, but, but it seems that they don't apply fundamentally. And instead, what is going to work is this theory of n functions. Okay. There are links, uh, the, the theory of n functions, the theory of uh, uh, n maps, so the linear, sorry, the theory of n matrices. So the linear case of this theory is highly related to Perron Frobenius uh, uh, theory. So there are links, but, uh, but, but you're gonna see these are very specific tools that we're going to, that we're gonna need. Okay, so what's the idea? The idea is that we, we have this set of equations. Let me show it to you. Okay, so we have basically unknowns uh, ax and dy. So uh, the dimensionality of the unknowns is cardinality of x plus cardinality of y. Okay, remember, we're gonna find a dimension here. Uh, we are going to reform, what we would like to do, what we are going to do is we're going to reformulate this, this system as a, uh, as a system of equation uh, 2p equals zero. So p is going to aggregate information uh, provided by A and uh, the information provided by B. So we'll see how exactly, but, but, but essentially P is A and B. Uh, and uh, um, we are going to, to show that uh, uh, we uh, can uh, uh, write uh, things in such a way that Q is an M function. So what is an M function? Um, so an M function is a nonlinear generalization of an M matrix. Okay, so what is an M matrix? Well, an M matrix is a matrix which uh, is a Z matrix. So what is a Z matrix, right? Uh, a Z matrix is a matrix that has off diagonal terms that are non-positive, okay? So all the, the, you know, all the off diagonal terms cannot be strictly positive. So they are either zero or less or equal than zero. Okay, so that's the first property that you need for an M matrix. And the second one that you need is to be non-reversing. Non okay, non-reversing meaning what? Meaning that if, uh, uh, if the matrix A is non-reversing, if uh, uh, whenever you have AP less or equal than zero, term by, by term, right? And P greater or equal than zero, uh, term by term, component by component, then P needs to be equal to zero. So this is an actually usually if you if you if you Google it if you look at Wikipedia or, or the most basic treatment on the M matrices this is usually not the way uh, those matrices are introduced usually uh, uh, people uh, prefer another definition which is an M matrix is both a Z matrix and a P matrix uh, but uh, this definition is equivalent I find it much simpler actually. Uh, so, so anyway, so, so there's a nice uh, book by Berman and Plemons on positive matrices where you have all those equivalences, uh, much, uh, much, much more, uh, maybe even more than, than you want to know on the, on the topic, but it's a, it's a great read. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, uh, uh, this is, uh, this is an N matrix. What we're going to do with functions, which we're going to generalize this idea, essentially, uh, at least in the differentiable case, an M function is going to be a function such that the, 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 the uh, Jacobian of the function is going to be an, an, an M matrix, but there's a way to define it without assuming differentiability, and it's very simple. So uh, an M function is going to be a function that has two properties. The first property is that it's a Z function. So what is a Z function? It's a function such, such that choose Z, is going to be weakly decreasing with respect to pz prime for z prime different than z. Okay, so so that's that's your idea that the Jacobian is off diagonally non-positive. Okay, uh, so qz is going to be decreasing or weakly decreasing with respect to all the other entries but z, all the other entries of p but z. 
So that's a, a, that's a Z function. And the second property that you need for an M function is that it's non-reversing. Uh, so if uh, uh, P is greater or equal than P prime in all the dimensions, and if Q is less or equal than Q prime in all the dimensions, then necessarily P needs to be equal to P prime. Okay, so the key property, uh, and uh, this is why those M functions are so interesting, is that M functions are inverse isotopes. What does it mean? It means that you know, for an M function, if QP is less or equal than QP prime, then P is less or equal than P prime. Okay. What does it mean? It means in particular that these functions are injective, right? If QP is equal to P prime, then you have the inequalities in both directions, and then you have P equals P prime. These functions were discovered in the uh, theory of networks. And uh, uh, you know it's a generalization of green, of uh, uh, the Laplacian and and green functions. Obviously, and if you think of the Laplacian, uh, this is going to be a Z matrix, and you can show it's non-reversing as well uh, up to you know normalizations. I'm not going to enter into details, but 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 essentially, you're going to get uh, uh, you know that uh, uh, that type of properties. <clears throat> Excuse me, Alfred. It's it's Jean David. Uh, I, I'm lost with the. Z Z notation and the Z prime notation. Can sorry, you... the Z is an index. The Z is an index. I'm sorry, Jean David. Okay, so it's the index of so it's a vector function, and it's, it's... yeah, it's a function from uh, R n to R n. Okay, and okay. Z is an index that runs between one and n. Okay, and that has to hold for every couple Z Z prime. Uh, yes, yeah, such that Z prime is different from Z. Okay, thank you. Okay. So basically, it means that when you take, you know, if the function is differentiable, if you take the Jacobian of the function uh, of diagonal, it's uh, it's less or equal than zero. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions? If you questions, you know, it's it don't hesitate because otherwise. Um, okay. Anyway, uh, feel free to interrupt. So yeah, that's what we want to do. That's what we want to do. We would like to, and, and so those functions very interest, are very interesting and important in economics because they carry the property of substitutability. Okay, so, so here the idea is that Q is going to be a demand system or, 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 or supply system. And so it means that, uh, you know, when the price of uh, apples increases, uh, people are going to uh, uh, sell less bananas, right? Uh, people are going to produce less bananas when the price of apples increase because they're going to shift from producing bananas to producing apples. Okay, uh, so this is this is the idea of substitutability. Okay, if the price of something increases, we're going to shift from producing something else to producing whatever has increased in price. So now let's uh, show that we can reformulate our system. Remember our system, it's this system uh, in such a way. Well, you know, here we need to work, we need to play a little bit with science because you see that the system as such is increasing both in AX and BY. But if we want the, uh, the uh, Z matrix property, it should be increasing in X and decreasing in BY. Well, that is not too bad, you know, we're going to change the sign. And, and, and this change of sign in optimal transport, we, we, we encounter it all the time. We encounter it all the time. Uh, actually, you know, uh, maybe even, you know, arguably that's, that's really the natural way of, of presenting optimal transport. We should have this, uh, this, this change of sign when, whenever we work, the, we work on the system. Because, you know, it's reflective of the, of the true uh, network structure uh, that we have. So let's change the sign. So we're going to change the sign on the side of X. So, you know, I'm going to define this unique vector P. P is going to be defined on Z. Z is the union of X and Y, okay? And I'm gonna change the sign of the potentials on the side of X. And I'm gonna not change the sign on the size of Y, okay? So I can rewrite the system. I can define my, my function Q. Uh, so basically I have changed the sign on the side of X. So I need to change sign twice. Uh, QX of P is going to be minus the sum of the Y of MXY of minus PX, PY. Okay, so you see that's great because it's indeed increasing in PX and decreasing in the PYs. Okay, and I'm going to define QY of P, which is going to be the sum over X, 
mxy of minus px py. And you see here as well, you know, it's great because it is increasing in py and it is decreasing in the px's, okay? And then uh, my system of equations, I'm, I'm going to uh, write it as QP equals Q, where Q is the concatenation of the vector N and N, but I need to be very careful, change the sign of uh, N because I have changed the sign here uh, of QX, okay? So that's great. That is a Z system. Q uh, is indeed, it's very easy to verify. I just did it, that Q is a Z function. But it is not an M system. It is not an M function. Q is not an M function. Why is Q not an M function? Well, clearly, because I said an M function needs to be injective. This is not injective, obviously. Uh, in the additive case, you know that if you add a constant to A and remove it to B, to the Bs, uh, you uh, are going to have the same solution uh, trivially. So here, it's a, little, it's a little less trivial because the system is non-additive. And I will come back. Uh, to these normalization issues. Uh, but still, you can figure out that, you know, basically when you add all the entries of Q, you get zero. Uh, so you have basically a, a rank deficiency or a nonlinear version of a rank deficiency. Okay. So what do we need to do? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to normalize. We're going to normalize one of the potential. Okay. And it's exactly as in the classical additive branch and Schrodinger system, apart from the fact that the normalization is going to be less trivial because you know it's not just adding a constant it's it's something a little bit more than that we'll we'll, we'll 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 go back to that but anyway let's take an element so arbitrarily i'm going to take an element in y okay so this is y uh, y cal it should be y cal so i'm going to take an element which i'm calling zero okay this is an element of y it's one of the one of the one of the elements of y one particular firm and i'm go going to normalize uh, uh, P on that on that element. So P0, I'm going to include that P0 equals pi. And then obviously the restricted system, I can drop one of the equation. I can drop the equation that corresponds to Y equals zero because they're all, they're not independent, right? They all sum to zero. If I sum all those equations, I'm going to uh, uh, essentially get zero. So I can drop an equation and I can basically uh, fix P0. So now I can view the system as a function uh, that goes from r minus zero to r, my, r to the power z minus zero to r to the power z minus zero. Okay, so I just dropped one dimension and I can show this time that q is an m function. Okay, okay so I've taken care of my normalization. Now I can show that q is an m function. It's very easy to see actually. Um, so, so, well, first of all, it is a z function that's, uh, it, 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 it inherits the z function when I drop, when I've dropped the one dimension, but it is also uh, an m function. And why is it an m function? I can show very easily that q is non-reversing. It's a little argument. I need to assume that qp is less or equal than qp prime, and that p is greater or equal than p prime. Uh, and I need to consider the set of z. So the z are either x or y's. But I need to consider z strictly greater, which is the set of z such that pz is strictly greater than pz prime. And I can show very easily that this set is empty, because if this set were non empty, I would get an inequality. So here, basically, I can use the, uh, the, the, the fact that q is a z function. I would get an inequality that would violate the fact that q is less or equal than q prime. Okay. Uh, so I have shown that z strictly greater is empty. So it means that basically all the pz are equal to the pz prime for all the z's. So thus p is equal to p. Okay, so that is quite good because with very you know uh, elementary tools, I have shown that q was injected. So if there is a solution, it's unique. Okay, if there is a solution, it's unique. Now I haven't shown that there were solutions. I'm about to, to do this now. Okay, and it's going to be a little bit more involved. And uh, and and again, you know, this is this is this is where basically we had to extend the theory of m functions uh, to to develop specific tools uh, for existence. Okay, so, so but here I'm going to show you the proof in the case of this very particular uh, uh, system, bipartite system, because we're interested in here here in optimal transport or generalization of optimal transport. But the theorems we have developed are more general. Okay, so here is our second result. Uh, our second result is that there is a solution. Okay, there is a solution, whatever the normalization is, whatever the normalization is. Okay. 
So in order to do that, uh, let me you know, show you a little bit the proof. Uh, and it's a mix of things that, uh, that are new and things that uh, you are going to recognize. Uh, so the first step, and that's quite an easy step, is to show that a sub-solution exists. So when I say sub-solution, remember, uh, if, you, if, you, if you take all the entries of Q, Q sums to zero, right? So the sum of a Z of QZP is equal to zero. So here, obviously, I'm dropping uh, the particular element that, I'm, that I have normalized, okay? So I'm dropping zero. And, and again, I'm viewing Q as a function uh, that excludes dimension zero, okay? So I'm, 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 I'm viewing Q as a function that, that takes values in Z minus zero, okay? In R to the power Z minus zero and sends there, okay? But I'm going to show that a, solution, a subsolution exists. So what is a subsolution? Is basically a P such that QZ of P is less or equal than QZ for all the Z that are not zero, okay? Uh, so I'm, that is going to be step one. The second step is going to basically build a Jacobi sequence that is going to start from a subsolution. This is very classical, and we're going to recall that it remains a subsolution and it's an increasing one. Uh, so then we will, we're going to have this uh, uh, Jacobi sequence of subsolutions that are increasing. Uh, I only have two solutions, right? Either these sequences remain bounded or they diverge. I'm going to show that they need to remain bounded. Okay, and then basically because they need to remain bounded, they're going to converge, and then necessarily going to converge to a solution. Okay, question on the strategy. Okay, so if there are no questions, I am going to go ahead with step one. I want to show that a sub-solution exists. So remember Q. Huh? Remember Q. Let me show you Q. I have changed the sign on the side of X. So Q X. P is minus the sum of the Y MXY minus PX PY. And on the side of Y, I haven't changed the sign. So it's the sum over X of MXY minus PX PY. Okay. I want to show that there is a P that is small enough such that Q for all those uh, terms but zero, but the Y that corresponds to zero is less than uh, minus MX MY. So let's think about, let's think a little bit about how to do this. Well, first of all, you know, let's, let's worry about, so I have, I have normalized the value of one of the y's, which I call zero. First of all, I'm gonna uh, be concerned with x. I'm gonna con be concerned with setting the value of p on the x's. And it's very easy what I should do because, you know, qx of p is equal to minus the sum of a y of mxy. In this sum here, there is in particular the value of y that corresponds to zero, which I have normalized. Uh, so because I'm summing those m, you know, they, 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 they are positive, okay? The m, x, y are positive because I'm, I have a sum of negative terms, the negative m's. Uh, this is less or equal uh, than the one term that corresponds to y equals zero. So this is less or equal than minus m of x is zero minus p x pi being the value of p at zero, at, at the node zero, okay? Huh? So essentially, what, does it, what is this telling me? It is telling me that if I set the value of px such that this quantity here is equal to minus nx, minus nx, remember, it's qx, then whatever I then set the value of py, however I set, whichever number I set for the values of py, I, I'm still going to get a subsolution at least for the x's, for all of the x's. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to set p bar x such that mx is zero of minus p bar x pi is equal to nx. Okay. And I'm sure that whatever I set for py, okay, the inequality that I'm looking for is going to be satisfied for the x's. And then, well, then now I've won for the x's. Now I just need to basically set the value uh, 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 for the y's that are not zero, uh, such that you know uh, uh, the sum over x of mxy of p bar x. So I've set p bar x already, uh, and I just need to ensure that you know uh, uh, p bar y is small enough so that this thing here is less or equal than my my being two y. And I'm done. Okay. So you see, it's very simple. I do this in two steps. 
Okay, so this is the bipartisan case. We have something that, that works for general networks under some properties. It's a bit more involved for general networks, but here it is super simple to have a solution. When it, once I have a solution, I have half of the work done because you know I'm going to consider a Jacobi sequence. I'm going to let it grow. I'm going to let it evolve. Uh, and again, it's going to be increasing and either it's going to stop. And if it stops, it's going to stop at the solution. Uh, but if it doesn't stop, it's going to divert. So then I need to show it that it's impossible that it diverts, which, which is what I'm going to do. But first, let's talk about Jacobi sequence. So Jacobi sequence, obviously, basically, uh, the Jacobi algorithm is consists in setting the value, updating the value of PZ, such that when you keep the previous values for all the other entries, you are going to clear, you are going to solve the, the, the Z, the equation that corresponds to index Z, okay? Uh, so this is a Jacobi sequence. Uh, basically, I can do this in parallel. So I can set the value of PT plus one Z such that two Z of PT plus one Z, PT minus Z. PT minus Z is the vector with all the other entries, but Z. Uh, so here, that one, I am I'm taking the previous, the previous value of P is equal to two Z. It's very easy to, to see that PT, if you start from a subsolution, at every point in time, you're going to keep a subsolution. So PT is always a subsolution. Uh, that's just manipulation and use the, uh, the, the, Z met, the Z function property of Q. And also that is going to be an increasing function. Okay, it's very easy to see why it's increasing. You start from a subsolution. So if you had replaced PT plus one Z by PT here, you would get an inequality. Now, two Z is increasing in PZ. So necessarily you need to have PT Z, less or equal than PT plus one Z, okay? So you have an increasing subsolution. We're gonna use that quite a lot. We're gonna, we're gonna use the fact that it's increased quite a lot. Just a remark, because we've, uh, we've heard talks about the IPSP, synchron algorithm, matrix scaling, RIS, and all this. Uh, uh, in the additive case, this algorithm is exactly this. It's exactly synchron. Okay, it's exactly synchron. Okay, so, so basically here we have a nonlinear analog of this algorithm. Okay, the last part, and arguably the more involved, although it's uh, uh, it's uh, it's not super involved. Uh, we need to show uh, that we are going to converge to a solution. So that we are going to converge. In fact. Because once we've converged, there's a fixed point argument uh, by continuity that says that if PT converges, then necessarily, you know, I, I, I take the limit in this expression, I use the continuity of Q, and, uh, and I'm done. I've shown that if, if PT converges, then it converges to a solution. So why does it converge? Well, it cannot blow up. PT cannot blow up. So let's show this. Okay, so the first idea is to say, well, you know, if I, if I uh, so I have a, a PT is a subsolution. Uh, so QZ is going to be less or equal uh, than, 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 Q, than little QZ for all Z but zero. But remember, if you sum QZ over all the Zs, including zero, you get zero. So it means that you know, for zero, you're gonna get the inequality in the other direction, okay? Zero, for zero, uh, you're gonna get that Q0 PT is going to be greater or equal than Q0. Q0 is N0, okay? So we're going to use this. Uh, we have M0, which is less or equal than Q0 PT. What is Q0 PT? If you remember, it's the sum over X of MXY minus PTX, PY, but PY is pi because we've not, sorry, P0, but P0 is pi, we've normalized the value of P0. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that at least all the PTs cannot tend to plus infinity. Because if all the PTs were, were to tend to plus infinity, then this function M would tend to, all those functions M would tend to zero uh, and you couldn't have this inequality, okay? It's a bit weak uh, because we'd like to show that uh, uh, all of them uh, remain bounded above, but at least we've shown that one, at least one is remaining bounded above. So we're gonna start with this. So we're gonna call X star, one such element, this is one element that is going to remain bounded above. So it's increasing bounded above, it converges. We're gonna call PX star infinite its limit. It's a, a finite number. 
Uh, and we're going to see, we're going to show, we're going to use this x star to show that all the py's are bounded, all of them now. Well, that's very easy to do. We're going to use uh, the fact that pt is a sub solution uh, on the side of x. So remember, on the side of x, I changed the signs. So writing that it's a sub solution is uh, uh, essentially saying that nx star is greater or equal uh, uh, than, um, um, than the sum of a y of nx star y minus pt x star py, which in turn is going to be uh, greater or equal than m x star y uh, evaluated at minus pt x star py, okay, because this is a sum of positive terms. Uh, which itself is going to be greater or equal than m x star y uh, evaluated at uh, uh, minus p infinite x star p y. Okay. So what does it buy you? Uh, m x uh, uh, star y is increasing in p y. It's going to buy you that p y remains bounded above. Okay. So it's bounded above. It's increasing. We're going to call p infinite y its limit. Okay. So now we know that all the p y T are going to remain uh, 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 bounded. They're going to converge. And we're going to use that in the final step to show that now all the PXs are going to uh, remain bounded. Okay. And this is a last manipulation. And again, using uh, the substitution property. And, uh, uh, and, and, and this, is, this is what we're going to get. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. So, so what we're going to have is that px is going to remain uh, uh, bounded above and thus converge. So, so what does it mean? It means that here, basically, this pt plus one and pt they converge to a limit. Okay, and hence by continuity, we're going to get that qz of p is equal to qz. All right. So once this is done, uh, we are happy because now we have shown the existence of the solution. We have shown uniqueness. There's a last result that we can show actually quite easily deduced from, uh, from the other two uh, is that, uh, uh, you know, if you parameterize P by this normalization, so P, P of pi is going to be a vector that is the solution uh, with the normalization on the, on the node zero, uh, then you can show that this is an increasing function of pi. Uh, so hence that if P is strictly less than P prime, pi is strictly less than pi prime, then pz for all the entries z is going to be strictly less than pz of pi prime. Very interestingly, uh, this is actually a non-linear, uh, non I mean, it's, it's a non-linear non analog, but it's related uh, with the Perron for Venus theorem in the sense that in the, uh, added in the, in the, in the matrix case, if Q is a matrix, if Q is linear, you could get this result uh, with the Perron Frobenius theorem. Okay, so I think I have one uh, uh, half a minute left, so, so I'm done. Uh, if you're interested in these economic applications, I'm, I'm giving these, uh, these lectures. It's called Math Plus Econ Plus Code. Uh, it's basically. Uh, it's basically on uh, uh, you know economic applications of optimal transport and some extension. Uh, so we we spend a lot of time you know taking a look at look at these uh, these models. So, so this has been on Zoom uh, for the last few months, but uh, but but you know lots of uh, of things on matching models uh, and, and and stuff like that. Optimal transport, blah blah blah. Anyway, basic and code. You can use this. Uh, you can use this website if you're, if you're interested. Okay, I'm done. Uh, so, yeah. so, any question here or online? Here, maybe. Uh, thank you, Alfred, for this very nice talk. It's, uh, I didn't know uh, at all uh, all you described. It's very very fascinating. Um, so, so just to be clear, so this is absolutely not connected to uh, optimization problems. These are, these are things that cannot be uh, formulated uh, in a variational way, right? Yeah, it's and I can show you general. why. Actually, I can show you why because if you take this system, if this were to be uh, an optimization problem, the Jacobian of this system would be symmetric. Uh -huh. 
-huh. You can show that the Jacobian of the system is symmetric if and only if uh, this is a function of uh, AX plus BY. Oh, okay, beautiful. Okay, all right, thanks. And, and um, yeah, um, is there some connect? I don't know anything about this, but is, is it somehow connected to like uh, topical, I mean, monotone maps or topical maps that people study in non linear Perron Frobenius uh, theory, or is it something that's totally different tools? And, uh, so I don't know. I don't know a lot about nonlinear Perron-Frobenius theory. Uh, what what I've seen because this guy. So actually, there's a nice there's a nice book on nonlinear Perron-Frobenius theory, which is by this Lemons. Lemons is also the you know the author of this book on uh, uh, positive matrices. Yes, yes, yes. Related, of course. Uh, but you know they make an assumption of positive homogeneity, yes. uh, which uh, which I don't, uh, which which I can't work with because there's no reason, you know, in the settings that I'm looking at, there's no reason that we should have positive homogeneity. Okay. So you know they assume a very particular shape uh, of uh, of invariance with respect to the AX and the BYs. Um, I don't know if you know other people. You know other people have have dispensed with this um, with this uh, with this thing. Yeah, it's almost all the time. Do they have this? Uh... Yeah, yeah. This is a fundamental hypothesis. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. And also, you mentioned rights. Uh, that's future work. I mean, uh, um, do you have some ideas that could be used to to, to find rights? Mm -hmm. Well, so rates is definitely related to Perron Frobenius, right? Um, so if we don't have a solid Perron Frobenius theory, nonlinear uh, Perron Frobenius theory to handle this, it's, it's going to be difficult to make progress on rates, I think. Okay. Um, so right now, you know, right now I focus on computation, uh, having an efficient algorithm to compute this, uh, because you know the, the type of problem uh, that that you encounter in economics. Um, let's see. I'm going to use this as a kind of whiteboard. Uh, so you want to solve things like this, okay? Okay, so I've shown something like this. It's going to be my. I said, well, let's normalize one of the let's let's normalize one of the BYs. And this is what I showed. Uh, but you know, in economics, what would be interesting is to, in fact, you know, uh, replace this this normalization by something that says that you know some function with some properties uh, of a and b is equal to zero. For instance, you know, there might be a, a cap on salaries. Um, or they might be a minimum wage, or the, you know. So in that case, if it's a minimum wage, you know, I'm going to have that uh, a function, whatever you know. There's there's a relationship of obviously between a x b y and the wages, and I can use that to express that you know there's a minimum wage and that w x y uh, cannot cannot go below something. That is going to give you your normalization. Uh, basically, so this is a more general normalization. Obviously, you know, there's one way to do, which is okay. I know how to, I know how to solve the system when I normalize one value of b. So I can run Jacobi for each value of pi. I can run ja Jacobi, mm -hmm. and I and then I can I can do dichotomy because once obviously you know this 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 normalization. I mean this this normalization can be expressed. As a function of pi, and it's an increasing function of pi, and I could, I can, I can, I can work by dichotomy, but that's super inefficient. That that's solving too, you know, far too many times this uh, this Jacobi system. It must be a direct way, but I, you know, it's it's. I, I think it's hard to find a way to solve the algorithm directly with the normalization. I don't know if I've been clear, but uh... okay, thank you. All that Thanks. to say that we're very far from rates. I mean, you know, uh, us. Us, you know, okay, I had a, a little uh, question of my own. Um, in the continuous case, in the, when you have stochastic process involved in the what you call the Bernstein Schrodinger problem, the vast majority of the process solving 
a problem of this kind are not Markovian. Uh, I was wondering if there is any relation whatsoever between the additivity and the non-additivity and Markov and non-Markov solution. Ah, that's very interesting. You know, I don't know, but 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 you know, it's it's uh, it's because it's, uh, uh, it's a relatively natural question because what is more easy to solve is indeed the Markov case, which is closer to the structure of quantum uh, mechanics, elementary quantum mechanics, and uh, the next step is when you are in quantum statistical mechanics. So uh, the solution are not are not Markovian anymore, but they are well-defined. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was hoping that there is a kind of trivial relation that I don't see between Markov, non-Markov, and additive and non-additive. But maybe there is none. Yeah, there must be something. I agree with you. There must be something, but... Uh... OK. Uh, anyone in the room has an idea about, about this? <laughs> no? Okay. So uh, then, thank you again, Alfred. <laughs>